For me, I went through FGM because I wanted to do it. In explaining FGM, ev- everyone in my life failed. I wish someone could have told me why FGM was bad. People are saying stop FGM, but why? I wanted to fit in. I never understood why there was so much noise on ending FGM. Girls get get cut and go to school. I wanted to know what I could do to avoid death. I said if giving birth could kill me, why am I carrying this baby? So I leave my baby alone without without a mother. This is the NFGM podcast with Caroline Lanoi Nampaso. Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. This is the second paragraph of the first chapter of Caroline Nampasu's memoir. It's never easy for someone to write their pain. It means having to relieve it. But what if the pain is constant, a never-ending grief that is permanently engraved in your heart, relieved every single day, in your memories, never to be erased or forgotten, having all your dreams shattered by one horrible mistake you made by your own choices. This is possibly the worst experience of my life. I write to tell the little girls in school what no one told me, how FGM will harm them later in their lives. I write to tell my story in the hopes it will change people's mind about the harmful practice, and I guess I write to atone for my mistake. I am seated here with this amazing lady, an author. She has written a book, uh, Beyond Shattered Dreams, and a memoir. I have gone through at least a part of your memoir, uh, of which I'm promising I'm going to finish uh, a little bit later. But I'd like to know why? Why FGM? I've heard so many stories about FGM, but no one has ever, no one has ever explained this. FGM according to how I and how I went through FGM. For me, I went through FGM not because my parents forced me, not because anyone forced me, but because I wanted to do it. And it was simply because I didn't know what FGM was. I just thought FGM is something that everyone must go through. And sometimes I blame so many people for not telling me what it was, the challenges of FGM, but it reached a point, I said, why blame them? And there are so many other girls who don't know what FGM is. I said, what am I doing to stop like the girls who don't know what FGM, why they're not supposed to go through FGM? Most of the people speak about it from a perspective of protecting other girls, but not having really um, given up their own little privacy. What prompted me was uh, back in 2012, 
after I cleared my college in Thika, I I got pregnant. And uh, me being pregnant, I started to worry. I started to, I had a lot of time to think because I was doing nothing. I I just finished school and I I just wanted to have a baby. For me, so I started reflecting on my life, what had happened. So I started researching like the effects of FGM on pregnancies and uh, I was scared. It was terrifying. I just lost an aunt while she was giving birth. And for all intent and purposes, I think I was the one who forced her to go through FGM. Because while I was in primary school, I we had groups. Like in every other school, you have the popular girls, the ones who know everything. So me being a Maasai in a Maasai community, in a Maasai setting, the school is in Maasai land. Like we used to, like it was kind of bullying. You bully girls who are not circumcised. You say, they started calling us names, the bigger girls now when I was younger. So that is what forced me to do FGM because I didn't want to be set aside. I didn't want to be not to be popular. I wanted to fit in. I never understood why there was so much noise on ending FGM and no one explained it to me. So when I was pregnant, that is when when I started doing my own research, I realized that I made a mistake. Basically, the worst mistake I could ever do. Everyone wants children in relationships and here is me scared of even getting pregnant because I think, oh, when I'm going to give birth, I'll die. Because labor is painful on its own. Now, when you add to someone who's undergone FGM, the experiences are far much worse. There is postpartum blood loss. There is, you have to maybe sometimes, if you're in a good place, you can go for C-section. I, it, it's just complicated for someone who's undergone FGM. And that worries you a lot. And I know... Um that could also be worrying to someone who, you know, realizes that this is where I am right now. But you found a way to relieve or probably share your experiences with the world. And you went on to writing books. Tell us a little bit about when you first thought of sharing your experiences through a book. I love books. For me, someone else can tell you I love music. Someone, But to me... I love books. Books ground me. When sometimes I'm in a book, I forget all the worries. In a book, you get the whole story. The story of Beyond Shattered Dreams is a story of a girl I met while I was pregnant and used to go to clinics in in Ololunga. There were no nurses who were my one of the nurses could call me and t- ask me to translate for her. When you're pregnant, you must undergo, you must be tested for HIV. So it was hard because they need to advise these women and they don't understand the language. That is actually how I started translating. So when in that office, you could hear so many stories. And one day they brought a girl who was sexually assaulted. And the mom couldn't understand what was going on. The girl was devastated. Obviously, she couldn't talk. So I was called to to listen to her, like to explain to the nurses what was going on. And her story touched me so much. She was sexually assaulted by someone she trusted. And uh, I, I felt so much pain for her. And I started writing. I was seeing there's so much pain in this girl. And I wanted to help her. There are no psychiatrists or psychologists back in the villages. So I took it as my responsibility to do it. And when I started writing small parts of my book, I experienced, sometimes it was too hard. Like the first, the prologue was actually very difficult because she was telling me what happened, the experience. But I usually, I like most of the people tell people, talk about it because it, at least a burden shared is uh, something like that. So I started writing. I started talking to her and beyond shattered dreams is actually it's a healing process for her. It was a healing process for her. She saw like her life was over because 
she didn't trust anyone she didn't even trust going out of her house and i took it as my responsibility to help her in as much as i was not no one to her just someone who she met in the hospital i usually take people's burden i don't know if everyone does that but i usually do that it was important for me to write to like be a voice to the voiceless to be a voice to that girl out there i this was one girl i was helping but i realized that i could help so many girls who have, who have undergone the same thing after i finished this book there were some things the teachers in primary schools in our village they they used to call me to talk to girls actually when i was in one school masantare primary school that is when i realized i could write my story of fgm i started telling them what made me undergo fgm and some girls actually could relate some of them were telling me hey, by the way even in this school so many girls tried to bully us into fgm and so i was telling i i said why can't i why don't i tell them my story i told them so i started going to schools around and telling them what fgm has done to me i took myself to be cut i i dragged my younger sister all of us went because i was the talkative one the one who knows everything so with my limited knowledge i pushed them to it and uh, so i started telling these girls in school that the the worst experience of my life was undergoing the cut the the worst mistake i've ever made in my life was undergoing the cut and if i could help to save even one girl from being bullied into doing fgm i was trying so much to to repair the damage i'd done but because i could not repair from the ones i'd pushed into it i started repairing from the people who are being bullied by others by telling them what experience what fgm does to them like their sexual relationships will be hard their um, childbirth will be hard sometimes can be catastrophic can lead to death when i gave birth <laughs> i i passed out it was like and going if gym a second time and now i was seated after giving birth and uh, the painful experience of healing again it was the same that i had undergone during fgm that is when i realized that every time i give birth it will be like i'm being cut again and again and again and me explaining it to those girls telling them that with people giving birth after every 2 years the four or five kids you want or the three kids you want you have undergone fgm first the first cut in giving birth to your first child the second cut in and so you will be like you are being circumcised again and again and again every time so i tell girls in schools the real experience my own not the ones like, like i've read from someone else telling someone else's story it's hard to tell someone else's story no one tells it better than yourself sometimes when you're told to stop something you want to do it you know um don't touch those things there you'll go and see what those are so in someone just telling you stop stop don't do fgm but you're not explaining to me why people are saying stop fgm but why i wanted to know the reason and as a child children are want to like children are curious they want to know more so in me wanting to know more i want i experience i did it myself in order to see why are people telling but it was a bad decision and being 11 years old I was not at a position to actually think about anything. I wish someone could have told me why FGM was bad. 
when they were telling me to don't do it. Because mostly we usually say, do not cut your girls, but really don't explain why it is not good to practice this. And I have heard many people say, don't cut the girls, let the girls go to school. But they don't really explain why the act itself, FGM on itself, is harmful. But they just talk about, you know, education is important, so don't cut your girls. My parents were against FGM. Um, I have the best parents in the world. And uh, <laughs> my dad was against FGM, always. And my dad has always told Masai, our community, to take their girls to school. So there was no option of me not going to school. Nowadays, there's no even option of girls not going to school anymore. Girls are going to school and peop- girls gets, get cut and go to school. So it's not a tip. People are getting cut so that they don't go to school. People are cut and they go to school. So the idea of telling people at the, let girls go to school, stop cutting them, doesn't make sense to me. Because people, so many people are cut and they are in schools. There was no option of me at getting cut and getting married. But in explaining FGM, ev- everyone in my life failed. My teachers, the activists who are saying stop FGM, the okay, I hate to say this, but even my parents, people who have undergone FGM themselves, my aunts, all of them failed because they didn't tell me why, why, why I don't, I didn't have to go through FGM. And if we could tell these girls why we are telling them not to undergo FGM, that will, that is something that will help. There are, there are girls, not, there are girls who will tell you, I've undergone FGM because I've told people who are not cut smell. Because that is how they had it. So, if someone could tell them, people just smell because they are dirty, not because they have not been cut. But no one told me that. No one explained to me why FGM was bad. Every time you read a story of rape, the reason actually I wrote this book was because in a way I could relate. Like the pain the girl experienced, what was happening to her when that, when that man assaulted her. So in me, in my relationships, I saw it like this, it's brutal. So why can't I call it rape? In as much as it's consensual, it's painful. It's, it's not comfortable. Did writing a book make you, did it serve as a therapy to you as an individual? I didn't understand FGM. It helped me research FGM. I just told you I lost an aunt. She, she bled to death in the, in, while giving birth. And we lost her and her son. Coming from that and finding myself pregnant and knowing that in as much as many people were blaming the doctor, in my mind, it's I saw it as this is something could have been avoided. And finding myself pregnant and uh, I was terrified. So I started researching effects of FGM on pregnancies, on childbirth. And... <laughs> And with research, you'll get everything. The internet, asking, talking to women. My research actually in school right now, I'm in university, is on effects of, of childbirth on FG, uh, of FGM on childbirth. I wanted to know what I could do to avoid death. There was something I read about, I think there is a way to reverse FGM. I don't know. I've never found out really. But if there could be a way, I'll be the first in line. Any doctor who is doing that, I'll be the first one in line to, to do it. But in childbirth, I, I booked a CS 
like well i was four months pregnant in tenue hospital in bomet county because i was terrified and i said if giving birth will kill me why am i carrying this baby so i leave my baby alone without without a mother my sister has just had two kids and her experiences were terrible she and went cs my cousins they were cut during childbirth it's called parental tear or something all of them so i'm always there when they give birth i see their experiences and now i was waiting for my own and uh, i was scared i when i go to the hospital i talk to the nurses i ask them all the questions in the world and then one nurse asked me why are you asking these questions um because i'm scared of giving birth and she told me everyone is scared even people who are not undergone fgm are scared i used to tell them in a scale of 1 to 10 what are my chances <laughs> and she like she didn't want to scare me but she told no no it, it, but they maybe it will be nothing i told them you remember when i was uh, because i was treated in that hospital when i when uh, when we went to a village in near our home to and I got the cut we ran away from home to a village i i was cut and i think after while i was in the process i don't know i passed out and i just found myself in a hospital with my mom crying i don't know what happened but i told her when i was when i undergone the cut i i almost died now what are my chances if i almost died when i was undergoing the cut now what happens now that i'm going to give birth and i can imagine so many women out there who have undergone fgm there are no even hospitals near where they live our masailand is big it's so wide and sometimes hospitals are very far when i sit doing the research i was saying if i'm worried and there is a hospital a health center near me there is a hospital i have an option of going for cs what happens to these women who are even not near any hospitals what happens to them and then you started telling your story the girls in these different schools <laughs> girls used to spit on us um in kimasai like they used to like oh you saw what are you going to do in memory at as in something like that and it was so humiliating like it was these are your friends actually people who did that to me were people i thought were my friends and um i was young i was a kid 11 years old and i I couldn't understand why my friends have turned against me. One of them told me that they don't they no longer work with uncircumcised. They when you pass people will spit on the ground when you're passing in. It was so humiliating, so so degrading. Uh, someone can even cough and spit that kikohozi or something it, it was disgusting and i didn't want to feel that anymore well <laughs> while i was in the the term was the longest in my life that term when people were treating me differently when people i see it as bullying right now, then i didn't see it as bullying but when i came to real bad day like when i came back and thought what was happening i realized that these girls were bullying me they were making me do what i didn't want to do what i didn't understand and uh, first i was so bitter i 
I cut everyone else out, even the real friends who are still working with me. I had so many girls with, because I was in boarding school, I had other girls who are from different communities and they couldn't understand why I was so depressed, uh, what was happening, but my friends have left me. My friends are treating me like I'm trash. And uh, I was depressed. I started fall, falling in my education, my grades. I was doing okay in school, but and now like everything is slipping. A teacher could talk to me and and but one one teacher has thought ah, she's undergoing adolescence, so. And people change. No one knew that I was depressed. No one understood that. What was happening to me. Because I didn't even understand myself. But after I had gone through the the cut. When I came back to school. Instead of realizing. Because I had fainted. And I don't know what happened. During like that experience was bad. I didn't learn from my experience then. I became a bully myself again. I was the one doing the spitting. <laughs> I don't know. And then you emerged from it and now you put it down on pieces of paper and you are inspiring hundreds and hundreds of girls from different parts of Mass Island and beyond. And you've written and I have seen that the language is it's just plain, just as people speak, uh, what vulgar people, what vulgar language people use, you put it there. Why did you put it that way? I wanted to put it in a way it happened. Like, I don't want to create fantasies, things that are not there. I wanted it to be as real as possible. This is something that happened to me didn't happen to someone else. So it's being as real as I can be. Is telling it the way it happened. Because if I start twisting it here and there, what's, why am I telling it if I'm not telling it the way it happened? It defeats the purpose. The book is Beyond Shattered Dreams and the memoir, memoir of an FGM survivor. Tell us a little bit about it and why did you really decide to do um, this book? When I want to do something, I do something that I'm passionate about. And um, we are to, like these things we are writing, they're supposed to inspire social change. And for me, when I wrote the, like the project of Effects of FGM on childbirth. I could explain so many things. Like when even I'm doing the research. I could explain so many things. I could relate to so many things. And when I wrote it. I was like. These projects don't go anywhere anymore. Like. Uh, we just send it to NEC. And uh, nothing happens to it. The teacher reads it. You don't even give the class to read. But I said. But this memoir, if I write a memoir, how, how will this project inspire like social change if it does not go anywhere? So I said, if I put it in a memoir and write my own story and explain the effects of FGM in my book, the effects FGM had done to me personally, that could inspire social change. That could tell a girl in another country, in somewhere else. And this story will be read by people even after I'm gone. If, God forbid, FGM doesn't end. There's someone out there who will want to know effects of FGM. And for me, it's, I, want, I want it to help someone. Because the project... I didn't even take it anywhere else. Just gave it to the teacher and that's it. And it shelved somewhere. 
but this book it's published international in on kindle it's uh, it's published here in kenya and someone could read it when i go to those schools in in our local area i could give the kids the book to read and if they didn't understand what i was talking to them when they read they could understand i'd like to know um the challenges you went through while you know um writing this book <clears throat> beyond shattered dreams was my first book is my first book and uh, i didn't understand the publishing world i didn't even know i finished it and uh, i didn't even have a, lab, a computer i used to write in my phone on my phone or we get a uh, i used to have a book an exercise book I, and write so compiling it together like putting everything else together was so confusing i could read this paragraph i said was this before this or before this and until i published i didn't even <laughs> i it was later that i realized okay maybe i have confused some chapters and then i start redoing it again it took me two years and uh, it was so frustrating and not understanding publishing so there was a time i almost gave up i i because it was when i approach someone and ask them mm, how do you publish someone sometimes could give me a run around and you do this you do, i i was tired in the middle of it i finished the, the book it's there i have the pages i put it in a in my phone it's on soft copies but i didn't know what to do with it so that was the biggest challenge with beyond shattered dreams for for the memoir i don't know i i i, I wrote it in four days <laughs> non-stop <laughs> i I think there was a time I woke uh, I I slept for 2 hours and I started writing again. Sometimes I could forget even to eat because it was my story, it was something I understood. So everything was flowing. I'll finish this and I want to write this. I'll finish this. And I didn't get a lot of challenges with this and uh, for publishing it's I've not found a publisher in Kenya who could do it now because i want for this book i i want it to go fine wide right? and i wrote it it's small it's five chapters a prologue and an epilogue so it's about seven chapters so it's not so big because some people don't like most people don't like to read but with the memoir it's short it's small it's interesting it's fun it's uh, so anyone can read the the memoir was not so hard yeah and you have done that you have been able to share your stories you've been able to inspire many girls and you've been able to spread the message to people like me who would like to read the book and inform us from a perspective of you know these are the statistics that we've seen from these and these big organizations they've done this but you being able to share that experience from a personal level is uh, from a personal perspective is completely different and i think that what that's that's something that makes it much more relatable to people who are trying to understand you know fgm in general and that's just one person's story so imp- stories are important to us stories are able to make things relatable not only to legislators to uh, you know people who would like to go to undergo the cut you know it is important because uh, masailand is big there is samburu there is uh, there is narok there is kajiado county i know i cannot reach the entire counties I cannot but my book will reach everywhere. 
my book someone from even Turkana can read it i don't have to be there what advice would you give to anyone who wants to share their story before i started writing i asked someone who had already written what do i do to start writing and he told me you just start writing and i was like mm, how i will, i wanted to explain more but he couldn't i did what he said just write sometimes when you start writing you write what you know you don't try to force it sometimes we have writers block like you try to think of something in a kata you cannot force an idea and when something is true like in my memoir i told you i wrote in 4 days without stopping because it was so real it was it is my life so i don't even have to think of how to put it when you have something to say you can always say sometimes when you want to to do something you believe in ideas will come the message will come when you love writing you'll do it we've gone deep into this podcast and i honestly have learned a lot in regards to sharing your personal story writing is a powerful way to pass that message on and that's what you've been doing and that's what you still are doing so thank you very much first of all for you know sharing your your vulnerability sharing your story to the world that it's possible to speak about these things and create understanding within these communities we would like to extend these conversations if someone wants to reach out to you how would they do it if they would like to speak to you in regards to the book or whatever um cause they think that you would like to do together how would they be able to speak to you people can reach me through social media facebook caroline lanoi mm, twitter nampaso instagram lanoi nampaso my email lanoi nampaso at gmail.com on amazon reach the author anyone can send me a message and ask me questions on what they don't understand and yeah i think that is it together with the end fgm podcast team we really say thank you and uh, we appreciate you being being here today and uh, being able to share your story and your journey experiences the challenges you faced and what lessons we basically draw by the end of the day together with Tony Mwebia and Matilda Timpian from the NFGM podcast i would like to say thank you for listening to us today we've been having a caroline nampaso here at the NFGM podcast till next week stay safe you can get bonus materials notes and much more at www.kipainoi.com k i p a i n o i dot com please remember we all can do something go out and make a difference for we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place goodbye